Okay, we're recording. I'm going to go on mute. Have a great show, everyone. Cherish what your father said. Read the books your mother read. Stand up, solve your problems in your own sweet time. Others have more cash than you. Some may take a different view. My, oh my. Hey, hey, hey. You gotta be bad. You gotta be bold. You gotta be wiser. You gotta be hard. You gotta be tough. You gotta stay stronger. You gotta be cool, you gotta be calm, you gotta stay together. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. Cherish what your mother said, read the books your father read. Stand up and be patient, don't be afraid to cry. Love as they may cause your tears, go ahead, release your fears. My, oh my, hey. Stay stronger. You gotta be cool. You gotta stay calm. You gotta be together. All I know, all I know, love is the day. The time waits, no answers. It goes on with Leave you behind if you can stand your pain. The world keeps on spinning. Can't stop if you try to. Go ahead and solve it in your own sweet place. You gotta be paid, you gotta be bold, you gotta be wiser. You gotta be cool, you gotta stay calm, you gotta be together. You gotta be hard, you gotta be tough, you gotta be stronger. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. You gotta be paid, you gotta be bold, you gotta be wiser. You gotta be hard, you gotta be tough, you gotta stay stronger. You gotta be cool, you gotta stay calm, you gotta be together. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. All I know, all I know, love will save the day. Thank you.
just going to quickly do one of my own whilst you join. This is called H-A-P-P-Y. A huge thank you to Josie and Tommy for kicking us off with such style. I loved it. Hopefully we're in the vibe. I did hear a few people going, I don't know how you're going to follow that, Beth, and neither do I. But I'm going to give it my best, Beth, to go. Thank you so much for starting us off. And welcome, everybody, to the Work Joy book launch. We're here. It finally happened. I wrote a book. This is it. Work Joy, a toolkit for a better working life. And thank you, everybody who is joining uh, in today. It is lovely to see all your faces, but if you do need to go off screen, et cetera, that's fine too. The great thing I think about a digital party is that you can come in your pajamas. You can come with a beverage of your choice. Um, you can have your screen on, you can have your screen off, you can do whatever you like. But I'm so glad to have you all here. We've got lovely friends, family. Uh, we've got colleagues. We've got people I used to work with. We've got people I work with now. It's a lovely combination of uh, friends, new and old. And thank you all for coming along. And as you all know, we were going to be doing a live in-person party book launch last week. But then just before Christmas, we found out about the train strikes and decided that if I couldn't get into London, there might be a slight problem hosting my book party. So we're going to do it probably in the springtime when things get a bit lighter, when not so many people are doing dry January, when we can have a good old party. And maybe Josie and Tommy, you can come join us again. That would be lovely. We'd love to have you there. 
So what are we going to do today? Well, I'm going to kick off and talk a little bit about the book. I'm going to do you a very swift, what I call a work joy workout. So you've got a bit of work to do today. So grab your best pen, a nice notebook. If any of you are like me and have a collection of notebooks that are saved for something special, I'm not the only person who does that, I know for sure. Get that something special notebook so you can write some notes as we go through. I'm also joined by the wonderful Dr. Kate Goodger, who is going to be interviewing me. And I'm very excited to hear what she's got to ask me. And also she'll be asking questions from the audience. So if you have got questions, please do pop them into the chat as we go through. And I will ask as many as I can during our time. And if I can't answer all of them, I will make sure we get some answers out to you after the session today. So give me a thumbs up if you're on screen. Does that sound like what you're here for? Nobody signed into the wrong Zoom meeting and is actually expecting some kind of lecture on chemistry or something like that. Oh, you see, Karen's saying she's saved a very gold notebook for this very occasion. I love that. Oh, look, Matt's got a work joy notebook. They're special, they are. They're very special. You're very lucky. Oh, Ellie's got one too. Brilliant. So let's get started, shall we? And let me talk to you a little bit about work joy. I'm not going to talk for too long about this, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an introduction to it. And I always think that working life can be brilliant, fulfilling, engaging, life affirming and really hugely satisfying. But I think you probably know, too, that it can be annoying, frustrating, downright infuriating. And I think the interesting thing about work is it can be a combination of the two, both fulfilling and infuriating at the same time. Now, whether you work in a large global powerhouse or a small local business, whatever industry you're in, there are actually some features of working life that are really, really consistent. We all have bosses and colleagues and processes and policies and different culture and different people to navigate. And I think in life and at work, we all feel that gloom from time to time. From those minor irritations that build up over time, sometimes becoming mountains where mole hills once stood, to that awful, and we're on Monday, so who had it yesterday? Let's do a thumbs up if you had it. That awful Sunday night, pit of the stomach dread about going into work the next day. Anybody have that? Oh, Kate's got her thumbs up for that one. And I think you're going to spend more than a third of your entire life working a third. That's a massive, massive amount. 35%, 90,000 hours on average in your career working. And I just think, how can we take some personal responsibility and make sure that we're not gloomy much of the time? Now, there's a real world thing to this because we can't be joyful 100% of the time because real life gets in the way. But actually, there are so many things that we can do to build that work joy. And when I think about work joy, I think of it as that warm or happy feeling, the one that makes you feel good on the outside. It's where you're really hopeful and you can feel really energized to make some stuff happen. And when you feel like that resilience to take on some of those challenges, it's a state of positivity, it's a state of openness. And I think it's a great thing that it shows on the outside too. That warm feeling can translate into those real smiles, you know, the ones where you can tell by the eyes, a positive tone in your voice, and even a little skip in your step. But it doesn't always happen, and it doesn't always happen by magic. And my suggestion is that you experiment and practice creating and cultivating more work joy in your life. Now, that's what the book is for. It is a toolkit, it is highly practical, and it lays out a work joy method page by page. I like to consider it a bit of a manual for taking ownership of your working life and living with more joy at work. Now, the tools inside of it have been tried and tested, and you'll even read some real life stories from some of the people who are actually on the call today, who've managed to take some of the guidance to apply it to their own working life and to make a difference, to really transform how they feel when they're at work. Now, all the stories are confidential, but if you're on the line right now, you know who you are. And thank you so much for being one of the people who had um, given me their stories. So I'm going to do my first little poll. I'm going to pop it up now. And I just want you to give a sense of, I know the sense that we're on probably the first Monday of work of the new year in January 
and it's cold and it's dark. So we're not going from necessarily the best starting point. But right now, which best describes you? Are you in that zone of what I would call chronic work flu, where you feel Ugh, about work, where you just can't get that positivity going? Are you feeling a bit meh? I have tried for the last two years since I started writing this book, by the way, to find a better description than the word meh for this, and I can't do it. It's just a bit meh. You know when you're like, I'm not awful, I'm not great, I'm just a bit meh. If anyone can give me a better word, please do, because it's not actually a real word. Are you kind of neutral? Are you like, some days it's okay, some days it's not so bad, I kind of like feel where I'm at. Are you a bit, yeah, are you like, do you know what? Most of this stuff is really good. I actually really quite like my job. I like the people I work with. I like what I'm doing. I feel engaged. I feel energized by it. Or are you one of those rare people who right now is already at this blooming joyful level? Are you really feeling it? So you should see it up here. Uh, I think about half of you have responded so far. Give yourself a little think about that. Where are you on that spectrum? Chronic work bloom, right the way through to blooming joyful. I'm going to end it in about 10 seconds. Nearly all of you have popped your answers in now. Right, here we go. I'm going to end it. I'm going to share the results with you now. So on this call right now, we've got about 60 people. And actually, most of you, 46%, are in the joyful zone. I'm feeling a bit, yeah. 13% in that bloom and joyful. I wonder how many of those 13 people are the people who've already read the book and done the work. Who knows? 17% uh, in the middle at neutral, 20% a bit meh. We're going to do something for you today. It's going to take you from a bit meh, hopefully to a bit more neutral. And 4% of you in chronic work gloom. That 4%, whoever you are, I don't know who you are, but whoever you are, please, please, please give me a call, send me a message, drop me a line, and we will have a chat to see if we can get you out of chronic work gloom as quickly as possible. So let's have a little think about something that we can do to consider um, what you might take on. And this is one of the things within the book. It's about your squad and it's thinking about the people around you. And I thought, let's take this one because everybody, whether you're working full-time, part-time, whether you work for yourself, whether you work for other people, whether you work for a big organization, small organization, or even whether you do things like volunteering or you finish working, you're just spending time with other people. Everybody has people around them. And it's chapter seven in the book. So if you haven't got there yet, that's a good one to get to. Now, I always think that everyone needs a team around them who can provide you high level support and great challenge to keep you growing, to keep you interested, to help you out throughout your journey through work. And having a diverse group of people who have different perspectives, different strengths, different ideas will usually give you what you need. And I always think one of the first things to think of in your squad and the people around you is that you're actually the headline act. You're the main event, the protagonist, the lead singer, whichever metaphor works best for you. In other people's squads, you get to act as the backing singer to the lead. And that's also a really important part to play when you think about your squads. As the leader of the squad, you have the pleasure of choosing the cast. You're the executive producer of your own show and you sit on the casting couch with hiring and firing rights. And I think it's really important that you engage your squad and get ready to lead them to help you the best that you can. That might mean making the effort and doing some work, being clear about what and who you need. It's unlikely, not impossible, that most of your um, squad will not be mind readers staring into their crystal ball, knowing exactly how to help you. They'll be there living their lives, working through their own to-do lists, striving, struggling, generally being human and having everything that that involves. So you may need to be more direct than you have been before about who they are, how important they are to you and how they can help you out. And I know some of these things may feel a little bit awkward to start with, but actually, when you embark on a pursuit for properly positioned people in your squad, you'll actually find that you get so much more from the people around you and that you can give so much more back. So what I want you to think about here is to consider who are the people in your world? This is where grab your pen and paper, grab your notebook, be ready to do it. I'm going to give you a little exercise. It's a little writing exercise and I'm going to give you about three or four minutes to do it. What I want you to think about is who are the people in your world, your working world, really, who are there for you? 
So you don't need to necessarily think um, what they do for you yet. Just think about who are those people that you would go to with a question or ask for help or who always seem to be there helping you. So grab a pen and paper. I'm going to give you three minutes. I just want you to write a list of names. Just write them down. Um, and while we do this, we're gonna, I'm going to go on mute for a second. So three minutes, pen and paper. Who are the people who are around you, who support you, who help you out at work? Go for it. You're about halfway. So once you've got the initial thinking out, go a little bit deeper. Who else have you got? And maybe if you're thinking about work, think beyond work, but people who actually help you with work. Go for it. You're in the last 30 seconds. It's like the final countdown music coming in. And that's your time up. I can see Alison Jones there busy scribbling and Alison's book uh, came out just a couple of weeks before Christmas and it's all about exploratory writing. So, you know, you should be right on this one, Alison. It's a great book. Go and have a read of that one too. So let's have a think about this. And what I want to introduce you to next is some different people, some different roles that you might want to have in your squad. And see here the most beautiful illustrations. And I just want to, before I go on, give a massive shout out and to say a huge thank you to Tom Russell, who I think is on the call. Hi, Tom, give us a wave if you're there. From Inky hey. Thinking. Who, Good evening. You're amazing. He took my dodgy drawings and turned them into inspirational illustrations for the book. So mine were like proper back of a fag packet dodgy ones. And he's turned them into some of these beautiful things and you'll see them throughout the book. So Tom, take a little bow. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about now is six suggested squad positions that I think will give you a really balanced squad and help you whatever you want to do and whatever you're going to try and do in your working life. You may find that you'd label them slightly differently or you might want to add some additional roles to meet the, your unique needs. So feel free to adapt all this stuff to your personal situation. All this stuff is here to get you thinking and to start considering what it is that you could do. It's a starting point, not the end point. 
So every person in their squad will bring their own personality, their own style, their own role to play. And across your squad, you might have multiple people who play in the same position, yet bring their own unique perspective to it. You might also find you don't need all six of them. And you're unlikely, really, to need all of them all the time. You might naturally lean more on some people than others. And there are also what I call a rarely spotted squaddy, who, by the nature of their squad position and their personalities, may pop in and pop out of your life at those opportune moments or be there for a really limited period. Some squaddies may know each other through shared connection and others may never, ever meet. And unlike a normal team where you're thinking about that in the work context, the various levels of interaction, the various levels of knowing each other can actually be of great benefit. So some of the humans in your squad may play one position like a specialist, and some may play multiple positions like a generalist and able to adapt to whatever it is you need at the time, switching their hats as they go. And like any great team, they will use their individual strengths and be able to complement and support each other's skills. And I think when a squad is well cast, directed and enabled by their leader, remember that would be you, they'll provide a support that's greater than the sum of their parts. When you explore the positions, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about them now. You'll probably immediately recognise some people in your life. It would just be obvious. Other squaddies, maybe, maybe they're like waiting in the wings, quietly supporting you without actually you really recognising it and really understanding it. It's also likely, because I was as well, that you might be missing some people. You might be missing some positions. Some people may not be clear on what they offer for you. So you may need to seek people out or get clearer on people's positions and to create that rounded group. So let me talk you through these six different roles really, really quickly. And while I'm talking, perhaps start considering where some of the people who sprung to your mind fit in that list of people you've got with you right now. Let's start with the cheerleaders. The cheerleaders always see the good in you. They focus their attention on what you do really well. They build you up, they talk about your strengths, they advocate for you openly, and they are who you go to. You know those moments when you need a boost or a pep talk or a little bit of an ego boost. They're the people you go to. The second one's the challengers. They give you the feedback and advice you need to grow, to learn, to change. You know those wonderful people who can directly look you in the eye and give you those home truths, holding you accountable for making progress. And they are the people you call upon when you need that no holds barred guidance or a really good talking to when you need someone to kick you up the ass. A comrade is in it, whatever it is, with you right by your side. They offer that unwavering commitment to you through good times and bad and are always there for whatever you need it. It's likely they'll actually work with you and they're the first call when something good happens, when the shit hits the fan or when you have a crisis. The creatives, they help to spark those wonderful ideas, to consider alternative options, to help you define solutions. They offer questions to get your brain engaged. They share insight from various different viewpoints and they really help you expand your thinking. They step you out of your comfort zone. They're the people that you call upon when you're stuck in a rut, when you're stuck on a project or you're in a way of thinking that you just can't get yourself out of. Then the connectors, they locate the people you need and introduce you to them. They have this like magical little radar of who could help support and guide you. They use their vast personal network to enhance your network. And they're the person you go to when you ask this question, who do you know who can help with? And they suddenly have their magic black book ready and waiting for you. And then possibly the most least spotted, but the most magical of them all is the conjurer. I'm going to get my magic wand out here. The conjurer creates that magic that makes you feel optimistic, determined and brave. They have an indescribable quality that emanates this rare combination of both warmth and strength. And they provide you with the tools you need to do what you need, even when it's really hard. And a little bit like a fairy godmother, they seem to appear out of nowhere just when you need them and disappear off just as quickly. So the second part of the exercise now is to grab your list from a few minutes ago. And I'm gonna give you three minutes again. 
And on this one, I want you to look at those six roles. I want you to start assigning some people to roles, the people that you've got, the list of roles here. So three minutes. I'll give you a couple of examples of some people who are on the call here. And um, we've got the wonderful chat here who throughout my writing six months when I was really fully in it, he um, checked in on me every single Friday. And he was a great challenger because what he did is he offered me a carrot or a baguette. Now, in normal words, they would be carrots. Do you need some motivation? Do you need some inspiration? Or a stick, like, do you need a kick up the bum to get you going to make sure that your word count is where it needs to be? But on Instagram, the emojis don't have a stick. So it's a carrot or a baguette in our world now. So start thinking about those people. What do they offer you? And where might you allocate them? So three minutes again. Go for it. Start allocating some people. You've got a minute left. And time is up. Um, don't worry if you haven't got very far. It's an exercise that will probably take you a little bit longer. As I said, it's chapter seven in the book. And also something to remember with the book when you get it, um, there is a downloadable PDF to support it. So if you don't like writing in books because you feel like they should stay pure, which I know a lot of you do, you've got a whole downloadable PDF for you to do the exercises in as well. So make sure you go and download it. What I want you to think about now, and I'm going to do this on a poll again, so let me launch this. I'd love you to just think about for a minute or so, where have you got some strength in your squad? Now, most people, when they do this exercise, find that they've got lots of people who fit into three or four of those um, areas. Whereas other people, um, you might go, oh, I don't really have anyone who fits into that zone. So have a little think for a moment and 
consider where have you got some strength and then the second question you'll see on the poll is where do you think you might need to gather some more support what's a role you could really do with that you're not really engaging with at the moment or you need to get someone so give that a go I'll give you a couple of minutes to answer the poll Okay, nearly all of you have done your poll. I'll give you another few seconds to finish that off. <laughs> Alison, as the publisher, obviously thinks that writing in a book is a biblio crime. So me and Chet, we can be in our own little group of people who write in books and anyone else who wants to join us, you can. Um, strength, lots of people find, and actually this is not unusual from people who've um, worked through this exercise already, uh, cheerleaders, uh really strong there 66 percent 39 percent challenges yeah often challenges are the things that we're missing and we really want them but sometimes you can actually find your challenges in your cheerleaders you just haven't given them permission to challenge you and you just need to go and say to them you're a brilliant cheerleader what could I do better you know well, how could you help me with this comrades 61 percent comrades is a really interesting one and often depends on whether you've got a really good team at work versus whether you're working on your own if you're freelance or if maybe there's some people in your team that you wouldn't necessarily choose if you had the choice really low on creatives interesting who's there expanding your thinking you might need to step out of your working world and go and explore a little bit more in different places to be able to get some of those creatives in your life and connectors 27 they are amazing people to have um in your world and i know that they've been really really useful um conjurers some percent i mean conjurers is a rare one and it's interesting because i think they're the one it's the hardest to cultivate to go and find but when you find one in your life and in your world make sure you hold on to them and keep them in your world even if at a distance so that you can go to them when you need a little bit of magic but I find they're the ones that turn up when you need them they're not necessarily always there when you don't so something to take away something to think about something to do a little bit more exploration of if you're interested in it and um, go read chapter seven do the exercises that are in the workbook as well and see where it gets you to so next steps, map your squad out and um, let your squaddies know their value. One of the interesting things about squad is we often don't talk uh, to them about what they're doing for us. You know, saying thank you, asking for help and um, offering your support back to them and always be thinking about who are those new members. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Uh, oh, it's not there anyway. There we go. Cool. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh the person who is going to interview me today um but in fact i'm going to get her to introduce herself she's got herself here as chief mischief maker which is true in many many wonderful ways uh kate goodger over to you to do a bit of an intro thank you beth and, and thanks for the invitation to be here it's a huge privilege you know we all pick up these books off these shelves and and we read them and you never really get to meet the author or to be invited to something like this so really appreciative of the opportunity um for those that don't know me chief mischief maker just being a little bit playful in terms of role um you might think it's slightly on the edge when you find out my trade is psychology so i'm a psychologist so i think it might frighten some people in terms of oh my goodness i've got a psychologist that's also a mischief maker but but that's because um, my work in psychology is in the performance space and in particular historically has been in Olympic sports so I've been really fortunate 
to work with Team GB at Summer and Winter Olympics across seven Olympic Games, which was very cool. And then in the last five to 10 years, I've worked more in the corporate world. So I met Beth through um, an introduction via Liz in Moving Ahead. And we have been thick as thieves in partnering with different sessions um, until now, until today. And where it feels a really short time ago, Beth, there was a twinkle in your eye of, I might write this book. I'm kind of thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and now you've actually done it. So, in yeah. terms of of interviewing, um, and I love to be kind of open with the audience. That you said, come and come and ask me some questions, and I said, what do you want the questions? You're like, oh no, just kind of all figure it out. And the great thing is, um, Beth has confidence in me that I'll ask the right kind of questions. The mischief maker part comes out here, however, that this is not um, a, a casual interview to sell a book or to promote. We're not interested in any of those things. When we did have a prep conversation about this, we wanted this to be the extra piece, the extra slice thinking Joe Brand and the Bake Off, because we're both Bake Off fans. But it's an opportunity to, to dig beyond the book. And really, I wanted to try, if we can, to pick up on two areas. So it's to really enable us to understand this idea around work joy and work gloom, because that's not a language that's familiar to us. And what I love about it is it, it's the idea of challenging that we think we have to suspend joy that works this thing that I do and joy. I'm lucky if I get it. I might think about cultivating it, but generally it's not something that's associated with that everyday working demeanor. So I'm really interested to dig a little bit more around those two couple of things. And then also around the kind of how the book was made up and built, because there is so much written out there. Um, where do you begin with it with a book like that? So we're going to delve in those couple of spaces. I'm going to grill you. We're going to see how you cope, um, depending on if the audience save you or not. There is a mean round. Um, we've prepared that. So audience, if you are Beth's friend and you want to save her, then get ready with those questions. If you want to just be a little bit mischief making with me and you want me to grill her, then let me keep asking all the questions but really keen for this to be a conversation in and around the book and to further people's and I can see an evil twinkly eye in a lot of my friends right now who are like I'm not asking a question because I want you to do the mean round yeah, let's do the great the, uh, the hard yards so um I, I'm gonna jump right in Beth and I'm gonna ask um what will be a um yeah a challenging question from the get-go and the question in its simplest terms is why should people even care about this book you know, the wonderful poignant moment we have here is it's a Monday night, it's January, it's pretty dark outside. I know there's some New Yorkers on the, the call and maybe it's a, a wee bit different where you are, but the timing for this book is potentially ironically brilliant. But I still <laughs> wanted to ask the question, why, why should people even care about this book? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It's a really interesting one. And I'm going to start with, um, I don't really care if you care about the book. I care if you care about getting joy in your life. I care if you spend 30% of your life being miserable. I care about that. And if the book is a way to help you not be miserable for 30% of your life, I'm really, really up for it. We've seen so much of it in the last week. I don't know if any of you have been on social media. It's like, oh, the back to work grind. Oh, we've got to go in. Oh, the first day. Oh, hate it, hate it, hate it. You even hear it all the time, like hump day. Can we get through Wednesday? Can we make it to the end of the week? And I just think... What a miserable way to live your life when you're doing that day in, day out for 40, 50 years of your life. And I, um, so whether you, whether the book does anything for you or not, I just would like you to be happier, to be more joyful, to find more amazing things about your work, whether that's in the work you do now, whether it's about changing the work you do now, whether it's about actually reconnecting with your organization or your boss or the relationships you have in work or pushing yourself in your career, whatever it is. I care about you being more joyful at work. The book is like the second part of that, which is that might be a source to help you get there. Okay, I'm going to, have to go a bit harder. This is this is not cool. You answered that way too elegantly, and I'm kind of scrubbing down the answer because I could like do a talking that way to some of my client base. So when people are thinking about being adventurous like this, and I think Alison could probably talk to us more about this of writing a book. It's not an easy task it feels a pretty daunting task and I imagine that you know competition or pre-performance anxiety was there tonight or you've had the sleep this night so if will people make the zoom call will the link work will I appear naked in it all of that crazy thinking we have in the middle of the night so I just wanted to push this idea of bringing um, more joy to people if that's your purpose if that's your mission here 
why go out and do it via a book here? Because you've given up Fridays, which is a pretty cool day of the week. You've been beaten by sticks and carrots in order to make this book a reality. But but why a book? Why now? Um, so I think why now is it, it took me two and a bit years to actually write it. So why now is possibly slightly delayed. Um, <laughs> it, did. It, it took me quite a long time. And actually, I um, first came up with the idea and Alison, who you've seen on here is my wonderful publisher, Practical Inspiration Publishing, does this amazing course. If any of you ever thought about writing a book, and I've always wanted to write a book, always. I've never known what I wanted to write it about, which is why I didn't do it before. And then during kind of the first little bit of lockdown, this idea kept coming to me. And I, I, after 20 years of working in organizations, working with organizations, working with coaching people, working in HR, working in operations, working in all these different things in different industries, I kept coming back to the same challenges came back time and time and time again. So it didn't seem to matter which industry you worked in, the same themes, the same challenges were coming up. And with a little bit more time to think in lockdown, because I was no longer running around the country uh, delivering things, I had space where I used to travel. And I started coming up with this idea, and I'm a bit of a person that once I've named something, I need to do something with it. So I came up with this idea of work joy. And then I went on a wonderful course with Alison, which is a 10 day business book proposal challenge that is a like work out what you actually want to write. And it's amazing. So if anyone is interested in writing a book, go see Alison, it's brilliant. And at the end of that two weeks, I kind of had a really good structure. I knew what I wanted to talk about. And then I went and put it in the freezer for like a year and a half uh, where I did things like, actually, let's let's practice. Let's work out these concepts. There's many people on this call who were one of my podcast guests. And we talked about it from lots of different angles. And there's people on the call who've been through my coaching program of it, where we work through the things that are in the book, but in a kind of one to one and group coaching way. And then Alison got on the phone to me, I think it was probably about uh, the end of 2021. And she said, Beth, are you actually ever going to write this book? And I love it because that's the kind of challenger she is. She's brilliant at it. Wonderful. She said, are you actually ever going to write it? You're doing all this stuff. It's all over socials. You're doing all these things. But you said you're going to write a book. Are you going to do it? And I was like, OK, I probably should write the book. So I did. Um, and I did write it. Kind of, I, I booked out every Friday for six months and wrote the book. And I think... It's, it is a, an interesting process. It makes you really have to think about what you want to say. And I think it was just a combination of kind of timing and wanting to get this stuff out there and wanting to write a book and kind of bringing it all together. But there were, there were definitely days of those Fridays where nothing got written. There were days where nothing got written. And I just messed around doing other things. And then Chet would be like, oh, have you written any, have you written any words yet? But, I'm going to jump in Beth and I'm going to ask you something but Chet might want to come over the top and go no no that's not a real thing so we've got fact checker here but <laughs> as a um, as a psychologist people often say to me so you've got kids Kate you must be really good at managing your emotions around your children and you know bath time isn't chaos and mayhem and the transition to mobile phones and the, the, the ability to just lose your child instantly you must cope with that brilliantly the reality is I talk a really good game I practice and practice and practice but I have these moments so naturally as this book becomes more on the shelf and people start to talk about it they're going to say to you okay Beth so tell us about you then work joy work gloom so tell us about how you negotiate the work joy work gloom and Chet here's your chance to go yeah that's not that's not a real thing that's a blag one answer that's, that's a real answer but yeah how do you reconcile that for yourself if you practice what you preach how do you do that? Yeah it's an interesting one and one of the conversations I had before I started writing the book was if I'm going to write the book about joy I have to be joyful while I'm writing it so and it, this is a conversation I had with chat right we were like okay we have to make this process joyful not just achieving it and that's actually one of the things that comes out in the goals chapter is there's no point having a goal that feels like a really 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 hard slog and the joy is only at the end where do you build the joy in so on days where I wasn't feeling particularly joyful I did kind of excuse myself from it but then I had to kind of do a day at the weekend to make up when I was back into joyful mode. so part of it is I think a really it really helps if you have a deep understanding of what brings you joy and what doesn't. Now, I am most excited and energized by spending time with people and doing having conversations. So actually sitting down and writing something um, I thought was going to be really, really hard. So I thought, oh, this isn't going to 
it makes me joyful. So how am I going to make it? So we had all these conversations about, do I need to go somewhere else? Do I need to be in the right space? What do I do to get myself into the right zone to be joyful while I was writing it? And actually, it was really interesting because it's a, a bit more of an exploration for me. I really enjoyed the writing part and I didn't think I would. And it kind of brought out kind of a, a, a bit of a sense of actually, this is quite a calm day for me, considering how much time I spend doing sessions like this. Quite a calm day. It's quite a day to get you thinking in space. But what I also liked is I need, I, what I found out is I needed to have some meetings as well on that day, not just do the writing because I needed some kind of human contact. And I think uh, more generally in life is that, you know, I have always found whenever I've been away, and I've worked in lots of different industries, and actually some of my previous bosses are there on the line now. Hello, Vicky, I can see Karen there. Lovely to see you. Um, is that I've worked in lots of different industries, and I think I've always been able to go, do you know what my work here is done? And I'm going to move on and try something else. And I'm a bit of a, an adventurer and an explorer when it comes to careers and then I kind of ventured into doing my own thing and I get to work with wonderful people so I have probably slightly more control over my working life than people who are say in an organization do but I've made that happen so and you can do it in, in an organization as well but we think it's either one thing or another so there's something around knowing and working through it and finding the things that work for you have I actually answered your question I've gone totally around the houses no, you have lots of lovely examples there as well. And, and I think people want to know this is genuinely what you believe and you've tried and you've tested and practiced. This isn't an academic book. No, this is a book that's come from successes and failures, I, I imagine. There's something you touched on there. And when you were explaining the book concept to me, this was the one that was like, oh, wow. Wow, if you can do that, that's the thing. And the reason I say that's the thing that working in my practice and, and different people that you come across in different performance settings, it, it is unfortunately challenging for us not to fall into a victim mode sometimes when the pressure's on, we're working with difficult people, times are hard, the uncertainty that we're in, and that gloom is just consuming. And the bit that I love about your book, um, but also just your practice is how you create accountability, but you do it in a way that's compassionate, but it stops people sitting in this, this or sitting on the tantrum mat and saying, oh, I don't, not necessarily going to do something there. Here, you've created that accountability. So I'd be really keen if you could talk a little bit more about how accountability comes into your book, because there's some great stuff that's written generally, but it misses that accountability. And Melissa, who I see on um, the, the call as well, her book around the mental health and, and work, I love the accountability that's created there. We each have choices. So tell us a bit more about accountability and choices. Yeah, and like, a bit like the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. I think the first rule of Work Joy Club is that you have to accept that you have personal responsibility and that you are in charge of it. And I've talked about it before, and this is where I'm going to get slightly into the musicals thing, which I'm not going to do loads because Simon and I did on the podcast episode, is that it's like suddenly remembering, if you're in that state of gloom, that you're Dorothy and you have the ruby slippers and all you have to do is click your heels three times and you can do something about it. But clicking your heels three times might be, I need to go and have a chat with someone in my squad. It might be, I need to really think about what my goals are here and where I want to get to. It might be, I need to think a little bit about what direction I'm taking my career in. There are different ways and there's lots of different bits you can do, but you have to be the one to initiate it. Nobody is coming to fix it for you. Nobody is coming to change it for you. It's your life. You're spending a third of your life doing this thing called work do something about it if you've got a problem with it so it is kind of it's like a harsh message nice lovely things and some jazz I, but that's like I'm going to high five and big 10 that because that that messaging is so important that people can be empowered but in your book you're not talking about seismic changes you're talking about small intentional choices you talk about this idea of, of being an experimenter again let's let's understand a bit more about that so when you're saying experimenting what does that what does it even look like Beth okay I don't know if I'm doing it right what I'm going to say to you right now is that like this book is not a magic wand and you read it and suddenly it's all fixed. It's not like that. I think the book is a guide to some of the things that you can do that will help you to get to the point of understanding what you need to do to make it work for you. So there isn't a one size fits all version of work joy. 
what brings me joy, like standing and presenting to hundreds and hundreds of people and being on stage and talking to people and having conversations is another person's version of utter work bloom, right? We're all different. We all like different things. I like different levels of challenge. I like different people to work with, all of this stuff. So what I think this is about is about understanding that there's some processes you can work through that you can experiment with in a kind of joyful, playful way that you can work it through and then go, oh, it's not that, it's this. Or, oh, hang on a minute. I really loved it when I did that. Yeah. How do I do more of that every day? How do I go and talk to my boss and say, do you know what? I really love it when I get to do that. Can I do more of it? And to really take that ownership, but to experiment with stuff and to kind of be okay with the fact that, I mean, it's part of the work joy mindset. It's like, you're going to fail at some stuff. You're going to have a dabble and you're going to go, that is not the thing that works for me. <laughs> but that's okay because it's all just exploring and finding your way through definitely I'm, I'm going to ask one more and then I'm going to open up um, for people to ask questions remember I will go to the mean round if we uh, if we want to um, if the if the audience are so keen to learn more about you Beth and they don't offer questions equally if you want to chuck in questions do um, another really important area that I think you address through the book, not necessarily explicitly, but the fact that the book now exists out there is finding a way to talk about the emotional connection to work. We often, you know, just saying those words in the same sentence, our emotional connection to work. What the, what am I talking about? But actually that is so critical to how we show up for ourselves and for others. And, and we often don't think about, you know, how do we feel? How do we describe our emotions at work? And again, that's not just from the Melissa reference point, but in our day-to-day and I think the, the power potential of work joy versus work gloom is enabling us to talk a little bit about emotions around work. This is you know, me coming up to you in the coffee break and saying this is definitely a work joy day. I am loving da 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 da. But I wanted just to pick up, you use the words work joy, you know, joy is an unusual word or an unusual emotion to use in, you know, you could have talked happy, um, contentedness, peacefulness, a whole range of books have been written about that kind of stuff but joy how the heck do you arrive on work joy versus happiness and then just talk a little bit about that emotional connection piece so let me talk about the joy and the happiness thing first and I think and this is a really personal perspective but there is actually there's a really interesting TED talk on it which I will find and we can pop it out there and um, in some follow-up notes actually around this idea that happiness is too big and too major a goal to be able to work towards right so happiness is not defined by some of the stuff that you do you can't actually really take control of all of that stuff and it's like a big goal to have and it's a great goal to have but there are going to be things in your life which make you unhappy but you can still feel joyful at the same time and I think the idea of joy and you're right like work joy those two words very very rarely get seen together so hopefully that will make people go oh I want to get involved with this I want to have a conversation about this is that joy can be found in the fleeting moments. Joy can be found in the terrible stuff. You know, when you giggle at something because everything is so awful, but there's a moment of joy when there is a crisis. There's a mo there can be a moment of joy when everything's going wrong. You can actually find that. And there are things that you can actively do to make those things happen versus there's always going to be stuff in the world, in real life. There's gonna be things that happen to you personally, professionally. There's gonna be bad days and good days that aren't determined by the things that you can do. But actually you can always, I think, maybe not, probably, I, probably, I never say always, you can probably 95% of the time, if you wanted to, if you made the choice to, find some way to bring a little bit of joy into your world, even on the worst day even on the worst day, when you're doing the worst job in the world, when everything's gone wrong, when you're so annoyed at everybody, you know, when you're on one of those days where you're like, I hate everybody, all the humans are awful. Do you know what? You can probably still do something to bring yourself some joy that day. To ask yourself to find happiness that day, oh, I think that would be too hard. So I think there's something around joyfulness allows you to do teeny weeny things or big things and a combination joy allows other people to bring it to you but it also allows you to bring it to the world and I have totally forgotten what your question was but that was where I've got to but there was another half of the question wasn't there tell me what it was it was about the emotional connection part starting a conversation about how we're emotionally connected to our work yeah and I think we often 
have the conversation about how we're feeling disconnected to our work. So I hear a lot of people kind of going, oh, I really don't like my job anymore, or I really don't like this. I think there's, you know, we hear a lot of that, but we don't often hear that. Do you know what? This is the bit of work that I really, really love doing. This is the bit, you know, and for some people it might be like, oh, I've just done like the most perfect spreadsheet and everything added up. Or for some other people it could be, like for me, I am so easy when it comes to work, Joy. Like if you get me a new notepad, I'm there. Like Joy for the rest of the day, no matter what happens. So there is, there. <laughs> I think this whole thing about, let's talk about the emotional connection to each bit of our work, but let's talk about it in a sense of, let's talk about how other people bring us joy. Let's talk about how I can bring joy to other people. I mean, a great, one of the things I think about, about goals for the book is, it's not for me about like number of copies sold or anything like that. Although obviously that would be fantastic. That's almost like a side thing. For me, if you were to go into an organization and sit around like a canteen at lunchtime and you hear people saying something like, do you know what? I really got some work joy today by doing this. Or, hey, Kate, I'm feeling really gloomy today. Can we have a conversation that might help me snap out of it for a bit, that might help me do something? I think having that language and having that understanding that you can talk about your work from an emotional standpoint. I feel like emotions are quite hard to talk about, but actually if you can go a joy neutral gloom, where am I right now? You can probably get into that conversation in an easier way. Wonderful. I am um, kind of definitely shutting up now, Beth. I'm kind of looking at the chat and it's a little bit on fire, which is good. So there's references people are going to provide you with. So Helen's highlighted something she's going to share. But I'm going to go to Angus um, and then we'll go to uh, Jordan some questions. So a question from Angus. Did you explore or think about or talk about gender differences in the workshop book and how people respond? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, I did look at it. And if you look in the life section, there is some stuff around actually, in if you think about the bigger world of life, there's a little bit of stuff around, you know, kind of how much space and time different people have, like if you have caring responsibilities, which often is associated with gender, there's a bit there. But equally, when we were doing the kind of testing of all these things with the people who are working through the programs, giving it a go, um, we had probably... 75% of people were female going through it and 25% of people were male going through it. So we did have it skewed in that particular way because they're the people who were attracted to doing it. Um, but actually the exercises and the programs and what we talked about and what we worked through seem to work in just as good a way for different people. They just, because it's so individual and you approach it how you want to approach it, you can bring whatever background you have into it. Um, but I, I, you know, I'll totally go out there and say it has been tested on more women than men, which is in exact opposition to every other thing that's tested on more men than women. Bring the, bring the balance always. Uh... Which, you know, last week I was reading something online, which was for the first time ever in history, they have invented a crash test dummy that is a woman for the first time ever in 2022. They've never had a female body crash test dummy before. Bonkers. Bonkers. Anyway, bye bye. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, um, Jordan has actually taken the mean cap away from me. So, um, Jordan, thank you. Thank you. It's kind of sitting with you. So there's two questions here. And then I'm going to come to, to Lynn, um, who's also talked about maybe a future book here. So the questions for Jordan the first one is what advice would you give for building a squad when you've recently joined an organization remotely? That's a killer question. Oh. Such a good question, Jordan. And I feel like there may be some personal questions within that particular one, Jordan, knowing where you're at right now. So here's the thing. When you're doing stuff remotely, you have to structure the unstructured. Sounds weird. Um, you have to formalize the informal. So whereas if you were joining an organization, going into an office every day, you'd have those casual conversations around the coffee machine. You'd see people that I, the thing I think most people miss mostly about being at work is, you know, the conversation you have on the way in or the way out of a meeting, that one where you're just next to somebody and you happen to be walking with them. When you have those little moments of connection, it's those things that you're not gonna get. So what you need to do is you need to formalize that informal 
stuff. So it might be that you say to people, look, I'm new. Can anyone come and join me just for a coffee for 15 minutes on Friday? I just want to chat. I want to get to know you as a human. And I'm going to book this space in anyone who wants to come and join. You almost have to kind of like host it yourself and give yourself the opportunity to step into some more informal conversations. But you're going to have to have structure and process around things that should be informal. But I think that's just a fact. You're just going to have to find a way and to have some conversations and to just see what you can do and build those relationships and where you can have some one-to-ones if you can get into an office occasionally make the effort to do it I think a lot of people are in the zone of oh I'm not going to bother going to the office you know I'm supposed to go you know we can go two or three days a week I'm not sure if I'm going to go go and just see what that experience is like for you might be full of work might be full of work joy but you'll be able to see and navigate a bit better in that remote world Thank you, Beth. Um, and Jordan said it's actually Har- Harriet. So Harriet ah. is the middle one because there's a I second. Hope that helps. Um, and the second question from these two is how do you help people get out of a mindset where they think getting a promotion or moving job will fix their problems? Love that. Uh-huh. If I do this, I'm going to be happy. If I do this, I'm going to be joyful. How do you, and you know, particularly when I emphasize that word mindset, how do you start that shift for them? Yeah. So The first thing to start the shift is to accept that you cannot shift somebody else, they can only shift themselves. So if they really don't wanna get out of that mindset, don't waste your breath. (laughs) Like you've got someone who's just like, okay, fine. Go try it, see if you're happier, does it work? Oh no, okay, now we'll talk about it. I think there's something here around, if you are thinking that just changing one aspect is gonna fix it for you, you might be right. You might end up going to an organization and a job and a boss that's all perfect. I'm not sure that's likely to happen. I personally think that you would be best investing and thinking about how is it that you could understand your own levels of work joy first, that you can build and know what brings you work joy in an organization that maybe isn't perfect for you so that you then know better how to choose the right organization, the right role, the right boss, the right team, which is like 80% right. Because being 80% right is way better than aiming for for thinking it's going to be 100%, but getting 20%. So it's about how do you find a reality check within that? But personally, I would always recommend people do the work before they move. Because if you move and you've still got stuff going on, you're still not sure about what you want to do, you're still not sure about what your values are, you're not sure about what you can bring to this career, you haven't got that real good sense of self-belief that you need to be able to step into an interview, you're probably not going to move into something that's as amazing as you want it to be, and you're probably going to struggle with the same things over and over again. So if you want to get off the like cycle of doom, do the work before you move. Love that. And I'm picking up on people's um, commentary there uh, and reading quickly through. Yeah, lots of loving the answers on here. Picking up on what, uh, so this is Ellen and Sean, picking up on what was said with Simon in the podcast. When reframing work-life balance with people, what language would you use? So really, yeah, that's a really great question because that you know, people typically go to, oh yeah, work joy, that's about work-life balance. But Looking at that and a comment earlier made by, um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, So Lynn has given you the next book, which is Life Joy, but she makes a really important point, which is linked to Ellen and Sean, which is about, you know, it's not just about work. It's not just about life. It's it's both of those things, but it's not a work-life balance piece because you've created that accountability that do you know what brings you joy? If you don't, that sits with you which is a big part of the book. So what would that language be around helping people to reframe the work-life balance question? So if people haven't watched watched the podcast, um, I'll give you a little brief thing here, is that I really dislike the term work-life balance. It drives me bonkers. Uh, Firstly, it has work first, as if work is like the main thing and life is like a second thing. Uh, Hello, we're humans, life comes first, work comes second, I think. But there are times when those things slip over and it's the idea that you can have this ah, uh, I've got balance and now I've got balance. Everything in my life will be brilliant. There are 101 other things other than work-life balance that you might want to think about working on. And I think there's this idea that talk about life, talk about you as a human being, connect as a human first and see where that leads you and then talk about work. So if you're trying to reframe it with people, like if you're a manager and you you, you kind of don't want to talk about work-life balance, you want to talk about 
you know, how do these things fit into your life? Have those conversations. What's important to you in your life? What's important to you at work? How do we make those things work together in the best possible way? Knowing that we probably won't be at perfect balance all the time because sometimes stuff's going on at home. Sometimes stuff's going on at work. Sometimes it's just something completely different you want to talk about, not just work-life balance. And I think there's been a lot of stuff probably over the last 10 years that have kind of gone, if you can get work-life balance, everything will be brilliant. So you hear organizations advertising, we've got great work-life balance here. Okay, but do you have interesting work when you're there? Do you have engaging leaders? Do you have inspiration from people? Do you have all the other things you need to make work great? Work-life balance, if it is a thing, I'm not sure it is a thing, but if it was a thing, it's not the only thing. And it's also the reason that chapter two, after we've done the foundations of work joy, is all about life. And then think about how does work fit into that big thing of life. So I always say that the book is like a bit of a pick and mix. You don't have to read it front to back. You can kind of go and pick the bits that are relevant to you. But my big recommendation to you is if you're going to do pick and mix, read foundations and life first so that you can put everything into that context. I think um, I know the, the book's already out there in print, but I think Lucy has given a really nice, nice quote to go on the back of the book. She, she's just written work life. That's <laughs> <laughs> that thing has, has just come out. So Maria has a um, question, please. Well, seeing you said please, Maria, then of course we shall attend. Um, going back to work joy versus work gloom and acknowledge that we are all responsible. But what if you're surrounded by work gloom people too much? without being a Pollyanna, any tips? Maria, that's not a Pollyanna, that's an awesome question because that's reality. That's, yeah, this is not even there's, there's people here who've been there, like surrounded yeah. by, I call them mood hoovers. They're like the the anti-squad. Um, they're the people who kind of <laughs> bring you like gloom because they're either, you know, a <laughs> moaner. Oh my God, I hate moaning because moaning is so unbelievably unproductive. So with me, you get one moan. And if you come and moan about the same thing, but done nothing about it, I'm like, well, what are you going to do about it? Moaning, massively unproductive. You've got those people who are like the one up moans. They've either had it, done it better than you or had it worse than you in whatever you talk about. And um, there's the my way or the highway, which is I am the person who can decide this and I cannot alter from my route to suit. It. And there's so many different people. So read the mood, who this chapter would be one thing. And I think the other thing is to think about um, how could you, help them move out of some of that work gloom but the other side of that I think is Maria is to read chapter four number four which is all about boundaries and how do you build good boundaries maybe around people who are not helping in that way so if you've got people who are moaning how do you stop that affecting you and how do you help them or help yourself to not be affected by them I think is two things. And then maybe if it if it is like a chronic case of having some mood hoovers around you, how do you find your way to a different perspective, a different team, different people in the long run? But sometimes it's just one person. And sometimes I think like work gloom is really catching, but so is work joy. If the people are ready to kind of try and do some stuff with it. So I think definitely how might you help them, but also how do you help yourself not to be impacted by them? Yeah. I just want to throw this one in, Beth, because uh, Maria, that you know, the beauty of that question is it's so relatable. And you know, one of my greatest psychological interventions for an athlete, and you'll clearly see it's not very great when I tell you what it was, but um, they were effectively surrounded by a, a group of work gloomers. I did, I couldn't have called them that then, but when I look back now, that's what they were. The intervention was that when they were getting changed, ready to go out and perform, they simply moved the space that they were changing to another area where they weren't surrounded by the, the work gloomer individuals. And you think that was a change? For that athlete, it was, because they were just surrounded by either neutral or more positive, so making that physical move. But what's embedded within your question, is again, is back to we have to make choices for ourselves and and sometimes they're tough choices but it ultimately comes back down to us so thank you for that question it was was really wonderful um putting it in there so i'm mindful of time i'm mindful it's monday um i don't think i need to be mean because they've actually asked some pretty good questions and i'm not messing with jordan and harriet because they're definitely asking the toughy questions um but beth is there um anything by way of a finish that you would like to offer but my my final question which is uh, increasingly as I get older in life, what I'm interested in doing for people is helping them to think about 
life through experiences so not just through knowledge but experiences often mean you feel something and if we start to feel something we might do something about it so going back to those measures of success you said earlier it wasn't about um the numbers you know great to sell as many books as possible um and also you know to get through the amazon charts and all those wonderful things and maybe oprah we've already talked about all of those things and i'm coming with you when when you do that um but I'm I'm interested that from an experience perspective, what what would you like somebody to say that's read your book and is recommending it to somebody else? What would be the experience that you want them to the book to have engendered for them? So ideally, I would love for people to be able to go, I know what so there's a few things, like I know what brings me work joy, I know what I need to do to bring that, and I'm doing it. So there's something about going from thinking about it to actually doing yes. stuff nice so it's that and you know it's that thinking doing gap like how do we help people actually do it and that's what the experiment's for and that's really what the downloadable workbook is for as well it's like let's go on and go and do some stuff and try some stuff out and move into it and I think if I were to take it kind of a couple of steps further down that line it's then a kind of and I'm helping other people to do it as well so I'm kind of spreading the joy around I don't know why I'm doing this weird hand movement but that's just what's going on so kind of like the spreading of the joy able to take it and be the kind of bit of sunshine that comes into people's lives not in that way of jazz hands and sunshine but in a way of actually I'm going to help somebody do this because I'm going to help them move from their kind of state of either gloom to joy but actually here's one thing I always think about it is in the book is that if you are currently feeling quite a lot of work gloom please don't try to get to work joy immediately like that's kind of trying to zero to hero it go to neutral first if you can get to neutral you will make better decisions you will be able to see kind of the wood from the trees you won't be stuck in negativity bias which is often where we are when we're working because we only see the bad stuff get to neutral understand where neutral is and then build the joy awesome Thank you for um, enabling me to ask those questions. I do have a whole load more, but I'm going to hold back on that. Um, and thank you for those people um, with their questions and their comments and the references. Um, it's been brilliant and we'll definitely capture all of those parts. But it's your show, Beth. Um, and I think, you know, reading through the comments and seeing people's enthusiasm as they've join the call it's generally a moment to be able to congratulate you on, on having the book out there and having the courage to do something like this because lots of us talk about it and think about it but you're out there and the intent behind your work is is wonderful in the sense that you have a purpose in life which is to bring more joy and you're, you're kind of putting your money where your mouth is in terms of this book so thank you for taking the time and effort to read it I will definitely be passing on to people and trying and testing out but anything you'd like to say by way of close Thank you, Kate, and huge thank you to you for being my interviewer and for not being so mean. It was lovely. And to everybody who asked questions in today, I'm going to get their chat down and I'm going to send you a free copy of the book for those of you that popped questions in there. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, in a way of closing, just a couple of things from me. I'm just going to share my screen here. If you want to, and you don't have to, you might be like, nah, this whole concept's rubbish. I'm not interested in this. But I'm thinking that most of you on here, I kind of know, um, is how might you help promote the book if you want to? So this is just like a little two minute call out to you if you're up for it. The first one is today it's on Amazon, Kindle version 99p. Tomorrow it comes out in paperback on Amazon and at all good booksellers. So if you want to support some of your more local booksellers, please go. They might not have it in, but I think you can ask them and they can order it for you. If you want to help us on socials, um, take a picture of the book, take a picture of you with the book, do a video of you with the book and pop it onto any of your social channels. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you could tag at Create Work Joy and use the hashtag, hashtag Work Joy, that'd be fantastic. Um, writing a review. Now, Alison will tell me, push this, write a review, write a review. Writing a review helps whatever fancy algorithm this thingy is on Amazon. It helps, Alison's laughing because it is a funny old thing, isn't it? Um, helps it to become one of those things that people want to go and read. So if you want to, please do write a review. I would love it. Obviously read a bit of it first before you write a review. That'd be fantastic. And then, but actually, I think the most important thing here is in real life, tell people about it, share your thoughts on it, buy it as a gift from someone who's struggling, have it as a read in your book club or in your works place, library, whatever it is, just start talking about it. And the um, open for people uh, 
getting to know it, understand it, do the work yourself. And I think one of the great things about this is hopefully that there is joy in the process, not just the outcome of it. And before I finish off, I just wanted to kind of point you in the direction of some things that we have going on. We have the Work Joy Jam podcast. We're going to be launching season six later on in this year. There's loads of different people, different perspectives on joy. Go and have a listen. We have the Work Joy Way, which is the coaching program, which will take you through one to one coaching, group coaching and some experiments to work on to help you go from wherever you are to getting more work joy. And we also have our wonderful Club Work Joy, which is a community where we have events and get togethers and conversations all about this subject. And you can get hold of me on either of those email addresses. And before we finish off, there were just a few thank yous that I wanted to say. So first of all, Alison, thank you to you and the Practical Inspiration Publishing team for both taking this little nugget of an idea I had and helping it become something. And obviously working through the whole publishing process has been amazing. Um, to all of the storytellers in the book, you know who you are. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with me and with the world. To all the endorsers who've written lovely things about it and the people who've already written some reviews and my amazing beta readers who, when I was a bit like, uh, I'm not sure about it, breathed really great, amazing, fresh life into it. And also to my wonderful team, to Simon, to Lizzie, to Becky, to Dan, to Will, to Kate, for helping pull all of this stuff together. It's been amazing. And finally, to everyone here, thank you for coming along. Um, I know a Monday evening at seven o'clock isn't exactly the ideal time, but what we will do is I will organise, if you're up for it, put me a yes in it if you want me to do it, an in-person party celebration something there's lots of yeses coming up we will um get that sorted out for the springtime when you can have a bit more of a spring in your step a bit more of a lighter evening and really enjoy ourselves there so thank you all for coming along it's been amazing i hope you've enjoyed yourself do go download the book buy the book read the book do the work on the book and i would love to hear how you get on with it as well so thank you all and i will see you all soon <laughs> <laughs>